Good evening to everyone here in the audience and those who are watching online. Thank you for attending this evening's Base Town Hall, hosted by the Commanding General, Brigadier General Adolfo Garcia, Jr. I'm the Director of Communication Strategy and Operations, Nat Fay, and I'll be, I'll be serving as your MC tonight. So just a few housekeeping items before I turn the mic over to General Garcia. Please understand, again, this is a live stream event. We have a lot of folks watching online, so it's important that if you do have a question or you do have an answer for those who are asking the question, that you speak loudly, you use the microphones that we have provided, and we'll also try to answer some of those questions we've received via direct messages over the past week or those that we get during the live stream. We also ask that you please be respectful of everyone here and keep your questions as specific to an issue as possible. If you're dissatisfied about a particular service, we have the ICE system that is designed to enable you to address your concerns in detail. And if you have a specific issue in your residence uh, that needs fixing, we have members from the Housing Office, AMCC, and Liberty Housing here that can speak with you after the town hall as well. The topics we'd like to focus on tonight are about base living, not Marine Corps policy or operational commitments abroad. This session is expected to last about 90 minutes, and when we reach the 7.15 p.m. mark, I'll let everybody know that it's time to start wrapping things up. Now, as a footnote, if we don't, or if you feel like we haven't effectively answered your question, or we don't get to you in the time allotted, please seek out one of our Marines here in the theater or email us at, an, at our organizational inbox, which will be displayed up here at the end, uh, which can be found and can also be found on the resource table and the handouts that are there. Our goal is to answer each and every question, and if we don't answer it to your satisfaction, there are multiple ways we can continue that conversation. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to General Garcia. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I know that we have a lot of uh, folks listening on the live stream. Um, I want to say thank you for participating with us, and I know you guys have uh, busy nights, and there's also a conflict with the Lejeune High School, so those are here. Um, I appreciate it very much. Um, one of the Commandant's priorities is uh, to prepare the Marine Corps for the next fight and also balance quality of life for the Marines, the sailors, and the family members on our bases and in all our installations. And so, um, you know, this is this town hall, the last one we did was in 2018, believe it or not. And so we haven't done a town hall in, in, in a while, and that's why we want to be able to hear from you. We want to be able to uh, receive your questions, answer them to the best of our ability, and then also, uh, listen to any of your concerns and the important thing is that feedback this is your opportunity to provide that feedback to us I'm very proud of what we have here at Camp Lejeune um, and the services that we provide and the quality of life that we try to provide but I know that we're not perfect so if you have feedback if you have questions if you have concerns please voice them and uh, and we'll do our best to, uh, to answer them um, when I got in charge, I was a young officer, I used to say that, hey, when I get in charge, I'm going to change this, or I'm going to change that. Um, what I didn't know is uh, sometimes you have limited resources to be able to do that. Or sometimes, um, you know, we're spending taxpayer money. So there's, there's federal code, there's, uh, there is fiscal law, and there's things that move very slowly. And that's a challenge sometimes because that can be, uh, if, if you're not really patient, uh, some of the things that we're doing won't actually come to fruition five years from now. And that's just the way that uh, sometimes military construction or minor construction works. And so I ask that you, uh, you bear with us. We are, we are laying the, 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 the road for something that uh, will come, we'll be able to drive on five years from now. Just know that that takes time. Um, as we talk about limited resources, most of our money goes to keeping the lights on uh, on this base, uh, be able to provide uh, protection for the base, be able to provide those essential services uh, for us. 
But there is some discretionary money, and uh, I would call that the CG's reserve. And we will utilize that money for those quick wins or maybe something that we didn't anticipate. And so we've already used it. For example, um, we had a playground, uh, playground over there in Seth Williams, and uh, the request was for a fence around there. And so we went ahead and placed a fence uh, for, um, to be able to, to allow you know, certain kids to be able to, uh, to play there. So we did that, and it's a quick win, and we used some of our discretionary funds for that. So there are ways that we can do that, and we can uh, listen to your concerns, your questions, and also provide some feedback. I will tell you that um, we have a panel here of experts with decades of experience. And, uh, and I thought that that's probably the best way to do the town hall. Instead of just me coming up here and trying to answer your questions to the best of my ability, and then maybe taking some questions for the record, I thought we would uh, assemble a panel of experts so we can give that immediate feedback, answer those questions, um, and then maybe kind of explain on why we can't do certain things, or maybe kind of just take down your information and follow up with you if we can't answer the question. We are all invested in ensuring uh, the best quality of life possible, that, and that's something that we can afford. And I would say that um, I am personally invested. I was born on a military base. Most of my life was living on military bases. I have four kids. Their most you know, greatest memories and, and their formative years were on a military base. Um, I have a, a son who is a young Marine and another son who is trying to become a young Marine. So I am you know, invested. And when we say we're going to listen to you, we care about your concerns. And that comes from the heart. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panel here. Um, Sergeant Major Ryan Nicko is, uh, is my confidant and right-hand man. Uh, he, he deals a lot with troop and family welfare. He's also a great conduit uh, from the, uh, the tenant sergeant's major. Um, to be able to voice their concerns and work any issues. We have uh, Captain Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown is the Naval Medical Center Camp Lejeune uh, CO, also known as the hospital CO. So if you have any questions on, on medical or pharmacy related issues, uh, he's the one to ask. We have Lieutenant Colonel Ed Penales. Uh, he is our Provost Marshal and uh, he is primarily responsible for the security of the base and also for firearms registrations and many other things. We have Ms. Julie Fulton. She's our school liaison. Um, the school liaison is she is our, our primary liaison to the Dodia schools and also to our schools out in the community. So if you have any questions about schools, uh, please ask them to Julie Fulton. We have uh, Commander Bob Surrey. He's here representing our facilities. We have Captain Jim Brown. Jim, where you at? Captain Jim Brown is our director for facilities, but uh, Bob is our public works officer, and he touches everything, all our buildings, every road, every water, every volt of electricity. He's, he, he and his team of civil engineers are the ones that are doing that. Um, we have Mike Scalise. Mike Scalise is our G7. He's also our community relations and uh, government liaison. And so he works with our you know, great community partners that we have outside the base um, and, uh, and also lays, lays with them and uh, provides, you know, um, when they come on base and they want to see the base and want to hear about uh, some of the issues or some of the successes that we have, uh, Mike Scalise is the one doing that. Over here, we have our Director for Marine Corps Community Services, Ms. Sarah Wilchin. And uh, Sarah's portfolio is not only the retail side, but also the Marine and Family Program side. For example, the gyms, the CDCs, um, and also any counseling services. Um, we have uh, Mr. Chris Perkins. He is our Director of our, our Distribution Management offices, Office. So if you have like household goods, um, or something like that, um, you know, in the movements, he can do that. He's also representing the G4, uh, who is here. And, uh, you know, any questions on, uh, that you have on safety or any questions on crosswalks, uh, these gentlemen could answer that. Okay, now we're going to our housing, and I'm, I'm almost done here, so bear with me. We have our family housing director, or military housing director, uh, Ms. Mary Simmerman, and, uh, and she's kind of your liaison and advocate for uh, military housing. And then we have our two uh, partners, our military housing partners. We have uh, Mr. John Giltz from AMCC, and also Ms. Don Call from uh, Lincoln Military Housing. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Nat um, to get us started with the questions and answer. Uh, thank you, General. And um, for the audience, again, if you, uh, if you are interested in asking a question, you can queue up over here. There's one mic on a stand over here, and you can have a seat over there and make yourselves comfortable. Um, and just kind of line up there and we'll make you all, the ones who uh, took the time to come out here, you all will be the priority. So anytime I see somebody over there, I'm going to call on you first. And if I don't have any questions from the audience, then we'll get to the ones that have been uh, direct, messages, uh, uh, direct messages from Facebook. And I also have my trusty lieutenant who is also queuing some questions here. Uh, probably one of the first questions that we have gotten most recently is about the reduced hours at the TOP gate. So we figured we'd throw a softball question uh, to, our, to our panelists about the TOP gate. And there is some frustration because there are a number of people who use that, especially coming from Hubert and wanting to go to Onslow Beach or they regularly commute uh, or they're trying to get all the way down to Wilmington using Highway 172. We understand we've registered all those questions. Uh, so does somebody on the panel want to take a stab initially? I'll go ahead and take a stab at that first. And then uh, Tenant Corp Pinales can back me up if I, if I miss something. So one of our unresolved issues when I, when I took over uh, command of, uh, of this base, it was the TOP gate. Um, that's what the triangle outpost gate is what it's commonly known. And so the TOP gate is uh, about three months into it. Um, I had a commander come to me and say he had concerns with the TOP gate, with the, with the safety of the Marines that were uh, serving as sentries there, and also with the force protection requirements there. So that is kind of our, my top two priorities is ensuring the safety of those Marines that are operating the gate, and then also um, ensuring the force protection of, of all, everybody that works on this base and lives on this base. So those are the two top priorities. I know that um, it is causing an inconvenience for some of you once, once we do implement those reduced hours. And I understand there are second, third order effects on that. So this is what we're, we, we I um, held a, a planning team all together, a planning team, they took a look at, um, uh, traffic studies from previous years and then they also did a traffic study so it's two percent of the entire Camp Lejeune traffic goes through the TOP gate and then 50 percent of our unauthorized entries essentially our gate runners is what we call them is out of the TOP gate and most of our accidents that happen at a gate are at the TOP gate because it's just not really wide enough um, and so that puts at risk not only the Marines, the sentries, if, because the Marine has to go on the other side, because um, the Marine stands on the passenger side and has to go to the driver's side to be able to check the ID card. Um, and then also, uh, it's just, it, it has just become really dangerous. So what we did is uh, we put together a planning team. They came to us, and one of the recommendations was to close it all together. The other recommendations is reduce the uh, operating hours to those peak times. Um, and so before I went ahead and made a decision on that, I went to our largest tenant, briefed them on our analysis and the rationale for reducing those hours. And then also some of our local officials, we talked to them and briefed them on our rationale um, and also showed videos of uh, gate runners, what we had there. And so after that, so we're gonna do a 90 day assessment um, so for 90 days, we're going to reduce the operating hours. We'll, we'll make an assessment after those 90 days. But let me tell you this. My goal is to open that gate 24-7. Um, and the reason why is because we have a military construction project that we have submitted. We have not received funding for, but we have submitted that military construction project. That military construction project would provide that protection to those Marines, um, and it will also provide uh, force protection for the base, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. That's one of our top priorities. We've submitted it uh, for multiple years, and we'll continue to submit it. And, uh, and so the overall goal is to open it back up once we are able to provide those protections to those Marines. Looks like Colonel Pinellas, do you have anything else you want to add? I feel like we covered most of it, but. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so the only thing that I'd like to touch on, and you, and you mentioned the traffic studies, uh, just for perspective, we've 
conducted traffic studies at, from PMO uh, in 2019, traffic studies in 2022, and traffic studies last year. <clears throat> when the CG mentioned that only 2% of the overall Canada June traffic goes through the TOP gate, and that's, that's based on the assessment and the traffic studies that we received. But what I will tell you is when, when we looked at the, uh, during our OPTs and our planning conference, we recognized that some of the uh, communities members will be impacted by this decision. So we, look, we really took a look at that, and we took a look at the numbers through how the entire 24-hour cycle uh, during those uh, uh, traffic studies, and what, what the traffic studies show is of that 2% that comes through the TOP gate uh, <clears throat> for the overall traffic, about 90% of the traffic that transits to the, tra to the TOP gate comes to that gate during the times that the gate will be open, in the, the peak hours in the morning and peak hours in the afternoon. That was a very deliberate decision when we recommended these times to the CG because we were looking at the impact and making sure that we recognize uh, our community partners and our, uh, all the members of the community. The other thing that we did as well is we talked to our counterparts from local law enforcement, emergency services, and others in the community to make sure that this decision was made uh, collaborating with everybody that will be impacted by this decision. So that's again part of the, the, the ask and the task that uh, the, the planning team received from the Commanding General and then the, the, some of the recommendations that we made. And that's it, sir. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Pinellas. We have gotten a number of uh, concerns about the reduced hours at TOP gate. Um, we'll take all of those comments, we'll roll them all up, and we'll make sure uh, that if there is an aspect that was not answered about the TOP gate, that we get an answer back to you. Um, October uh, 23rd of last year, uh, we had a spouses roundtable. And during that time, uh, this was hosted by the CMC's wife um, and a number of other spouses. And there were a number of concerns that were brought up and a lot of the questions that we couldn't get to um, came up, and this is kind of us making good on the promise to uh, to address some of those that we had at the at the spouses roundtable. So, for the record, um, there were some concerns uh, regarding uh, a lack of adequate um, adaptive parks on base, and at schools, and a desire for uh, handicapped access to Onslow Beach. Um, so there was some folks wondering what has been done to accommodate uh, special needs kids, especially in the housing areas at Onslow Beach. Um, John, you want to take the first shot at that for the housing? Okay, thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, so first off, the, the family that asked that on behalf of all the other families that probably have the same question, thank you. I mean, these are some of our most challenged and difficult and hard fighting working families every day and so to be able to find out where these facilities exist is a great question and I hope it, I hope it helps the community. So for, I can only speak for AMCC. We've got 117 playgrounds. That's a lot. And that's all over, all over AMCC which is everywhere. But we do have one special playground that was built a few years ago that is an all-inclusive playground and it's right next to the Bicentennial Community Center, which is right off Stone Street, uh, just a baseball's throw from that new bridge on the overpass. Uh, and as an example of how we definitely try to bend over backwards and work with these families, uh, last fall we had a, a young spouse contact us about a child with cystic fibrosis, and could we put a swing in so that her child could swing? And I think within a couple weeks we had one in that playground. We took, took a bay out. And, uh, and put one in there. So it's the best we have right now. We do have future plans to move towards more all-inclusive playgrounds. Uh, frankly, they're a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece. That's hard for us right now. Uh, but uh, we do love those families. And when they reach out to us, we do everything we can to take care of them. Now, as far as where the amenities are, we're updating our map online. That should be done by the end of March. So you can click and see where our, all of our amenities are. And we're gonna have links to MCCS and when or if DOD, uh, DODEA allows access to playgrounds that might be better for, for kids in general as well, we'll link that in there as well. But certainly understand where that question's coming from. We do everything we can for those families, and thank you. You want to talk about Onslow Beach there, Sarah? Or? 
Yeah, thank you for the question as well. So uh, appreciate the desire to enjoy the beach uh, for everyone. Um, we were looking into some of the recommendations and suggestions about rollout type of ramp access. And uh, a lot of folks have experienced different beaches and all beaches do differ. And the challenge that we're finding right now in looking at some of those options are the massive tide changes that we have. So we can go from having a few feet of beach to nothing. So that's one thing we're just trying to work through, but we are, we are looking at the recommendations and suggestions. We also have a bank of uh, wheelchairs that are uh, beach accessible, and we keep those uh, there at the beach, and they're free to anyone who wants to use them. And so uh, we're also looking at uh, other options in accessible wheelchairs. Um, there, there are some that are cost prohibitive and some that might be you know, better options than the ones that we have. But we do appreciate the question and we're going to continue to do some research there. And I know Julie has a little bit of information. Where's Julie? On the um, study of school playgrounds. Right. I spoke with the uh, superintendent this week and the Dodia school playgrounds that are accessible, the ones that are not on the interior of the schools, um, are free for residents to use on the weekends and after school hours. Some of those have more adaptive equipment than others um, and the equipment that is placed at those schools depends on the students and the IEPs and what is required for those particular students. So anybody who has a specific question about that, I can um, get you in contact with Brandy Elbinger who is the Instructional Support Specialist for Special Education for the Dodia Schools. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question comes from one of our direct messages. Uh, so excuse me if I have to read this. Can we have something done about the potholes on Bougainville Drive between Wilson Boulevard and Camp Johnson Gate? Uh, they could, there, are compl uh, there are complaints about them being only temporarily filled with gravel and then they're eventually washing out. Does anyone have an update on potholes there? As a public works officer, uh, I, uh, I'm the person to update you on potholes. <laughs> yep. uh, we're aware of the challenges in that area. That road wasn't built for the type of traffic that it sees now. Uh, we've done temporary repairs there over time. Um, so uh, we'll take a closer look uh, and provide feedback via uh, NAT on additional actions that we can take to make that uh, even higher quality. Um, but it is an enduring problem, that area, so we're aware of it. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Saray. All right, this one applies to housing again. Uh, it says, please address the situation regarding military base housing units, particularly field grade houses in Paradise Point being rented to retirees, civil service members, and base employees, not active duty. John, you want to take that? All right, well again, thank you for the question. Uh, I want to start off before I answer it uh, by, by thanking those waterfall residents as we refer to them for living with us. We would be bankrupt without them. And I don't want to speak for the leadership sitting up here in the front row or General Garcia or the commanders before him or the Commandant or anybody else, but I don't think the Marine Corps wants to get back into the housing business. So first off to those families, thank you. Because you take a bit of a risk signing a 12 month lease knowing at the end of it you go month to month at any time you could be asked to leave. And they have been asked to leave after Florence. So that's my first point, we need them. They're good neighbors. They go through the vetting process. Many of them are retirees. Many of them are, are uh, employees on the base. But to the question, look, I get it. We just recently started uh, to move into that Paradise Point area with waterfall. And it's a direct result of the losses that we had seen based on empty houses for an extended period and the fact that we do have waterfall or civilian residents who do qualify and in many cases are willing to pay more than some of you are to live in that house. So that's point number one. Point number two, uh, and some of you if you live there you may have seen just a couple hours ago, what we're really trying to figure out is what the real problem is. Uh, and there was reference in the question uh, either read or I saw earlier to the fact that, quote unquote, there are families being told there's no house for them 
uh, and then there's a direct correlation uh, made to waterfall residents. What's really occurring uh, as a retired officer myself is that right now and starting last month and over the next few weeks, officers are getting their orders and they're calling and they're asking, am I going to have a house? And I can only tell you what I know. And there are still empty homes in that neighborhood right now. And there were five or six that were empty from last July until this fall. That's, that's a lot of BAH not being able to get put back into the project because that's where it goes. And so what we're trying to do now to answer the question, uh, and really the root of the question, I believe, is we sent out today a request. Because your lease says you have to give us 30 days notice. A request to let us know sooner. It doesn't replace your 30 day notice, but let us know sooner so that we can plan, we can work with the military housing office on, they do all the 06 assignments, and we can work the rest so that we can tell those coming after you, I can't give you an address yet, but you're very likely gonna get a house because you're 32 on the list and we now know there's 35 moving out. And in the absence of this new initiative, we may have only known about 10. So the cycle of officer orders, when they move, when they make their leasing decisions out in town is the root of the problem and not the fact that you've got some new good neighbors in your area that are helping all of us uh, contribute to the problem set, which is as much revenue as we can bring in so I can put it back in your houses. Now I will say, because I see the chief of staff, I dorked this one up a little bit. He and I had good communications on the first couple that broke down on, the, on a couple after that. And I talked to him yesterday and recommitted to telling him more in advance about what we're doing and why we're doing it, to be able to make the case in the neighborhood about why this is okay and how a lot of logic and thought went into it. And so for that, Chief, I apologize again. We'll do better. Thank you. Okay. I, I asked Nat to, um, if we can kind of rotate, instead of just getting all the questions that were sent online, if we can, uh, if we can ask if there's any questions over here inside the theater, and then also, you know, anybody that's live streaming, we'll see if they have any questions. So we can kind of rotate a little bit. Nat, go ahead. Oh, we do. We have plenty that are coming in. Uh, a few more about the TOP gate. Uh, one uh, interested party was hoping to see. Oh, I, I apologize. Go ahead, sir. Hold on one second. I'm not, I'm not quite that tall. There we go. All right. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Master Gunnery Sergeant McLaughlin, and I do have a question about the Triangle Gate on, on a few different things. Uh, you said about the reduced hours to be able to go ahead and allow the traffic to still flow through there. Since that gate is one of the oldest gates out there that has not had any renovation to it, even though you did say that you're looking at doing renovations, um, is there any quick fixes that can be put in place for turning lanes to help the school buses that are truck stuck in that traffic in the morning, um, along with the locals that are trying to get to work, since on a, on a regular basis, there is anywhere from a 10 minutes to 30 minute wait out there every single morning during those peak performance hours. Um, also, the other portion I, I, I'd like to go ahead and ask is you originally mentioned the closure of the gate uh, due to the security and the just the threat con to the personnel that are out there and that you're going to do a 90 day assessment. During that 90 days, if you, you determine that the traffic is too overwhelming to reroute everyone to our already over populated and over traffic area out on 24 and Piney Green during that time, and it, it shows that it had value to keep that gate open. Um, how are you going to go ahead and provide that security that you were worried about back to those Marines for uh, what you originally shut it down for? Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, I'll take the first portion of your question. If I understand correctly, you wanted to talk about the, the traffic on Highway 24 in the morning due to the uh, additional traffic going through the, through the TOP gate. Is that correct? Uh, yes, General. So it's the traffic that comes off of 172 and Bear Creek because there's those two lanes that merge together, and it's a single lane that comes in there. Um, and there's also uh, very often when you go through that gate, the guard does not scan your ID, which could be thrown off the data that you might have collected to determine the 2% usage 
um, because I can tell you from a, a frequent user of that gate, it is, it is extremely busy um, throughout the mornings. Okay, thank you very much for the clarification. I, I, I think I misunderstood initially, but let me, let me say first, uh, during our planning process, we did uh, talk to our, our counterparts in the, in the city, in the state, and at least on, along Highway 24, we will be working with them to, to ensure that the timing and the sequency of the traffic lights is adjusted so that uh, we can better assess and move traffic along the way on Highway 24 towards Piney Green and Hong Kong, et cetera, in the morning hours. Uh, with regards to your uh, question about the, the scanning of the ID cards with divots in the morning, uh, just let, like to tell you that the, the way that we do the traffic studies does not rely on divots. We rely on other devices or traffic counters for that particular traffic study, sir. And what would be the adjustments made if you do determine to open that gate back up to provide protections to the Marine that stands that post? Talk about the project, the project that we have, the Milcon project. We're phoning a friend from, uh, from the stands. So I think what we're referring to is the military construction project that would build what we call a UFC, a Unified Facilities Criteria requirement for the gate, which set the gate much further inbound so you'd have a lot of reaction time for the guards and those kinds of things. That's roughly a 10 or $15 million project. Um, so it's on our MILCON list. It's a priority for that. Your question in the immediate future is, you know, it's confined to that space. And so far we've made a conscious decision not to piecemeal it because we have to completely relocate the gate and everything is in the, even the small versions of that are four or five million dollars to make enough real estate there to do I think what you're asking. But I think that goes into the larger question of, you know, can we continue to operate it the way we are? But and what, what we've also done is um, we've increased the lighting there, especially at night. Um, you know, we didn't have that there. So we increased the lighting. It's a lot brighter there. And we also put rumble strips. I don't know if, you, if you're tracking that we put rumble strips on there to bring, to just bring attention to those uh, vehicles that are just coming down that road at, at a high rate of speed to alert them that there is a gate sentry there. So we did that. But we still have uh, gate runners, even though we've done all those things. So we didn't just take a look at this and said, okay, well, let's just shut it down. We took a look at how do we mitigate the risk to those Marines over there? And th we did those small things to try to mitigate the risk. Um, and now the, the only way that we can mitigate the risk right now is to primarily do it during daylight hours and during peak hours. Um, but we're still going to do the assessment, and we'll give it a, an honest effort and take a look at it. And, and we may have to make adjustments based off that 90-day assessment. Okay, we have another uh, TOP-related one coming from online. Uh, yesterday at TOP at 8 a.m., there were still lines from both directions. Would people in line be turned around at 8 a.m. when it presumably closed, or will the co traffic continue through? Uh, th this interested party said, I was in line for 45 minutes. Uh, so, Lieutenant Colonel Pinalis, you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah I'll take this one. Uh, so as part of the, uh, the, the, the process for implementing this decision on 12 March, we have a few, a few more weeks to think till we get there. My operations team at PMO is now right now working on making sure we have a specific procedures for the TOPGA that are refined for the new environment that we are about to get into on 12, on 12 March. Uh, one of the things we talked about is specifically this particular scenario when something like that happens and we have a queue at zero, zero 0800 in the morning, what do we do? Do we close the gate immediately or do we allow the, everybody to come through and, and get to, to work at that in the morning? Um, <clears throat> we don't have a complete product yet. We're looking through that, but I can tell you that the decision will be to allow everybody to come in. And then once the queue is clear, we close the gate. And that will be my direction to the staff. <clears throat> Gentlemen, at the mic. Good evening, uh, Lieutenant Vandy Sloan. I work at Courthouse Bay, and I know on main side it might not seem like that big of a deal for uh, closing the back, you know, 172 gate, but uh, 
there's a lot of traffic from the four or five commands in courthouse and, and along the southern edge of the base that use that gate, especially if you're going over to Cherry Point. It saves you probably 20 minutes uh, trying to get over to meetings there, and I, I have to do that a couple times a month. Uh, and usually it's midday. Uh, I always see cars at that gate, even, you know, at, unless it's at night, which I could see justification for closing the gate at night um, after the busy hours because that just makes sense, you know, the darkness and whatever. But during the daytime, especially arguments, I, I read, you know, probably 200 comments were made um, about closing the gate online uh, when it was posted a couple days ago on, on the Facebook page, and most of them were negative. So there's a lot of people it's impacting. Um, and, and especially people saying, well, well, what about, you know, Saturday, people want to get to the beach and they come from Swansboro, they use that gate to get to the beach. So, you know, could there be some hours like on Saturday or something like that? I think there's a lot more questions and just doing a study of who is getting through the gate isn't going to analyze who's not and, and how many people is it disadvantaging, um, you know, by making the decision that we made. So. I think there was a question in there. Could you just... I guess I'm concerned, uh, it, could you open the gate just during the daytime and close it at night? I guess that's the main question I have. Okay, thank you for your question. And I, and I think we're gonna do a 90 day assessment. We'll take a look at it. And uh, if, uh, if, we make, if we need to make any adjustments based off of the traffic that is going through there, we will, we will look to make some adjustments. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I don't know what else to say about that, but uh, we, we will definitely take a look at it and we'll make an assessment. Uh, because it's been termed the 172 gate, I think there is, there has been some confusion about the Sneeds Ferry gate getting severely reduced hours like the TOP gate. Uh, big opportunity to clear up any misinformation. I believe the Sneeds Ferry gate is still going to stay open 24-7. Correct? Am I correct on that? Yes, that is correct. There, there will be no changes to the operating hours at the TOP gate. TOP gate, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Sneeds Ferry gate. The Sneed Ferry case will continue to be open 24-7. There's also a question about expanding the hours at the Piney Green Gate to accommodate uh, the reduced hours at the TOP Gate. Any uh, measure afoot to do that? That piece, uh, in, in conjunction with the work that we did for the TOP Gate and the analysis there, the traffic studies, we're also conducting, as we speak, a traffic study at the uh, Piney Green Gate, and that will continue once we open the, <clears throat> uh, once we implement the decision for the TOP gate. So we want to see what happens, how it looks now before it is implemented, and then how it looks after it is implemented. This is all part of that assessment and the 90 day assessment that we talked about. So we're not only looking at the TOP gate alone, we're also looking at the impact in other areas, such as the Piney Green Gate, Holcomb Gate. Uh, all along the Highway 24, and again, in, con in conjunction with our partners out in the state and the city, that sequencing and the timing of the traffic lights, all of that is part of the assessment that is going to allow us to inform decision makers in the CG 90 days from now so that we can either <coughs> sustain, improve, or adjust the decision that's, that's being made now. But again, we are implementing this two weeks, 12 March. Uh, we are already working on our assessment in the other areas, and all of that will be combined in, 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 in a good report 90 days after the implementation of the TOP gate uh, uh, decision on 12 March. Sir, so gentleman at the mic. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I got like three questions, if you don't mind. Um, first one is, uh, can we get some PMO presence down at um, the intersection of what is this, Seth Williams and Stone Street. Uh, that's a high traffic area during um, after school and before school hours and I usually walk my daughter there and there's been some times where uh, it's been kind of sketchy. Uh, people kind of running some yellows and you know, I know we have road guards out there. They're doing a great job, but I think maybe some PMO presence out there um, just to kind of you know, raise awareness uh, there's a lot of kids walking through that street. Stone Street especially is very high traffic. Uh, the curve is really close to the, is very narrow, is very close to the, uh, the road. And when my, my son, uh, you know, rides a scooter through there, I just freak out every day. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if we can do anything about that. Yes, sir. <laughs> 
Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Uh, let me first uh, tell you that uh, not only uh, do I work at PMO as the Provost Marshal, but I am also a resident of Camp Lejeune, so I live in this community. I live right on Seth Williams Boulevard my, myself. My daughter is a student at uh, Bits IS. She's in fifth grade, so she, she, I know that route that you're talking about. My son is in middle school at Bristol, Boulevard, uh, Bristol uh, Middle School, so I know exactly that's a running route, that's a, that's a work route. Uh, so we, we know exactly what, what you're referring to. Uh, this type of uh, request from the community, uh, I'm always listening to that. Uh, there was uh, another resident from, from that same area that asked me to, uh, to do ad an additional enforcement in that, in that area, which we have done, both for Stone Street and also for Seth Williams, and we will continue to do that. So we'll, when I get back to, uh, to PMO tomorrow, we'll work with the operations section and we'll uh, figure out a way to ensure that uh, we can pr provide presence in that area. Right now we have I guess a, a school resource officer assigned to BITS in, in the middle school and also the uh, Johnson Primary. We also have a school resource officer at Brewster Middle School and another one at the high school. All of them are also tasked with that area of Stone Street in the morning for additional patrolling and traffic enforcement. So that, that is part of our design uh, when we assign it, uh, assign it, uh, those individuals to, that, to the schools. But there's, so, there's more we, that we can do, and uh, we appreciate that the, the community will bring those issues up so that we can address it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, second question is, uh, can we look at maybe uh, implementing some speed bumps in some of the uh, communities? I know some people are just like flying down, like, again, has some close calls, and uh, yeah. Potentially. So um, you're talking about Stone Street. Uh, Stone Street came up previously in a, in a different venue as one of the places where um, uh, there were speed and safety problems. And um, so Public Works and, and Base Safety looked at it, uh, as well as we had some civil engineers with traffic experience look at it. Uh, and our first answer is uh, 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 flashing um, uh, walk sign traffic caution light uh, for the reasons that you just articulated. So uh, right now we have a project to install five of those at crosswalks along Stone Street, uh, and that should be done in April of 2024. Um, for speed bumps, we have to look at, and study the exact scenario to see if it's appropriate to put in. Uh, you don't want to put a speed bump in where it's going to actually cause traffic safety problems, So, uh, but potentially depending on the scenario. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, just like in 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 like in the communities themselves, uh, not specifically on Stone Street, but just like inside the communities. Like I know, you know, um, in my residence specifically, they implemented uh, um, a uh, uh, speedometer so they can see whatever speed they're right. going at. But I mean, they're still. I mean, I can see the, what speed they're going at. And they're just flying. Um, so specifically, sure. like, uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I, I apologize. Are you, you're talking about inside base housing, correct? Yes. Inside where you're living, inside where your kids are running around and yes. having a good time, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure that we were being clear because we're getting a little derailed, and okay. I want to make yeah. sure we're clear. Yeah, specifically inside the housing communities. So if you can identify specific areas and... Uh, we'll be around the, the PM and I after this is complete. Uh, we'll take a look at those and get back to you. Yes, sir. All right. Um, Thanks. And then my final question, um, more geared towards Sarah, Miss um, Sarah. Um, after school programs, um, I know I've been on the waiting list for months now for my daughter. Uh, are we doing anything to open up more after school programs for school age kids? So. Well, thank you for your question. Yeah, we, we are limited to the population that we're currently working with, and we, we work those waiting lists as much as we can. Uh, the challenge is, is the prioritization lists that come from Headquarters Marine Corps and Department of Defense, and, those are, and you know those priorities. So sometimes it's frustrating, I understand, to be moving along a wait list and then kind of going backwards. Um, we, we keep those programs uh, fairly full, but um, if you wanted to talk to anyone in particular within our family care program just about kind of what your status is, hopefully we've given you regular updates and we're happy to you know, continue to make sure that we're communicating well with you. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I mean, I call regularly, like, pretty much daily. Um, and I'm just trying to see, like, if, you know, is there's more resources going to be allocated towards maybe opening up, like, in school, after school, instead of, like, busing them to a different location. Maybe if that's more feasible, more affordable, I don't know. So I'm going to have to take that for further review. I do know, you know, the two programs that we have are programs that are funded, but I'll, I'll certainly, you know, I want to get make sure that we can get your name afterwards and make sure that somebody can circle back to you on further discovery. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then just the final request, uh, I don't know if we can take a look at maybe putting some uh, lights in the uh, softball fields in the high schools. The, the softball team is doing great this year, but they got to cut the game short because there's no lights. Oh, yeah. Um, I can, if, I, if you can give your information to Corporal Brown, I can get you in touch with Dr. Carver, the high school principal, and Mr. Smith. I know they're always looking at their sports fields and what monies they have available. And they would be able to give you the details on that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the online audience um, who's uh, emailing more uh, statements alerting us to some safety issues. They're not necessarily questions, but uh, they particularly mention Lyman Road is a racetrack. Uh, Alabama Avenue is another area that they said people are uh, speeding through. We'll make sure these are registered remarks. Uh, and also someone commented about trimming down the trees and bushes by Watkins Village entrance because it blocks the visual for kids uh, crossing uh, for those of us in the cars. Okay, so a few, uh, a few uh, safety concerns there. Um, we have another question uh, specific to MCCS. Uh, the concern is, is that they want more communication regarding youth sports programs. Uh, they particularly point to uh, Camp Pendleton had a, a Facebook uh, address for youth sports where a lot of the communication occurred and they're wondering if the same thing can apply to Camp Lejeune. Nat, thank you for the question and thank you for the uh, patron that sent it to us. Um, so uh, there are a couple options that we have. We, we run multiple Facebook pages and uh, we would ask uh, for the time being, while we're considering this, to use the main MCCS Lejeune Facebook page to communicate that way. Um, we also communicate on youth sports through our website, and if you're not familiar with that, um, it's usmc-mccs.org, and you can go now through the entire Marine Corps, no matter where you're stationed. That is the standard uh, website, and so you can, uh, there's ease of functionality. Every installation has the same format, so you can easily locate, you know, where youth sports would be and all the information there. We also communicate uh, through our marketing marquees uh, at Lejeune and New River in, in WAN, WAN or WAN, I never know how to say that, uh, messaging uh, with Comstrat. And then the main lines of communication that we would uh, also make sure that parents are familiar with is we, we work uh, very closely to communicate with our coaches and then the coaches to the patrons. Um, there was also a suggestion from the West Coast about looking at a particular uh, website which is called, um, what was the suggestion, League App. Um, uh, again, uh, Headquarters Marine Corps uh, is the one that vets any apps or any websites that we could use, and we will um, uh, go to them to look at that particular option. Uh, one <coughs> hopeful thing on the horizon that we've been uh, excited about getting closer to the finish line, we've been working this for a long time, is um, an actual MCCS app. We're not allowed to develop those organically. Um, I know that they have a few of them out there at other installations. They don't have an authority to operate, and those will have to be, be wound down. But we've been working diligently with Headquarters Marine Corps on an MCCS app, and that would solve a lot of uh, those types of issues. So that's what I have in reference to that topic, Nat. Thank you. Gentlemen, sir, at the mic. Thank you, sir. Good evening, ladies. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is First Lieutenant Carlos Ortiz. I'm a JAG officer. I'm currently in the legal assistance billet over at Building 66. I've noticed a recent uptick on dog attacks 
happening on base. Uh, for example, one of my clients was walking in the, the local neighborhood and her tiny dog was nearly mauled to death and she herself was also bitten. So I'm wondering what is being done to ensure that banned breeds are kept off the base and uh, to ensure families comply with the Marine Corps order on pets. Thank you. That goes to PMO. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, so PMO has a section that's called the uh, domestic animal control. They are their, their subject matter experts when it comes to, to pets aboard the installation. Their, their job is to ensure that people comply with these rules and regulations. There are specific Marine Corps and base orders that uh, details the, the requirements and the prohibitions for banned breeds. Uh, my team at the domestic animal control uh, section is responsible for making sure that, that that takes place. In addition to that, they provide uh, frequent inspections to ensure people are in compliance, not just the moment they register, but through how the time that they live here. Now, I will tell you that if there's a specific issues or problems that you see in your communities, please call PMO so that we can go out and, and assess the situation. We have several known emergency lines and, and we can make sure that we send our domestic animal control uh, to your area so that uh, we can ad ad address the situation immediately. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, sir. Ma'am, please go ahead with your question. Um, hello. Uh, and uh, first I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I heard somebody mention about the crosswalks earlier. Um, actually, our, the school board brought that up to uh, base earlier this year. So on behalf of my other school board people, thank you for taking care of that because um, I see kids almost get run over every day on Stone Street in the morning and afternoon right now. Um, I hope those will get taken care of. My question relates back into housing uh, specifically. Um, I know Berkeley and Watkins has been an issue. Um, what is, because we were recently told that the order was canceled, which made no sense to me. Uh, the order regarding juveniles being out at night, we've got a lot of kids running like the Wild West in the neighborhoods, uh, knocking on windows, scaring people, uh, causing destruction on the homes that are, you know, abandoned currently in the neighborhoods. Um, do we have a base order on curfew right now? And if so, what is it? And um, because there's lots of things in the old order that I could find that are relevant for dealing with situations and we couldn't find a new one. Thank so, you. So I'm going to give you a reference. Uh, one court, this came the June order 5500.6 Bravo. That is the order that uh, uh, talked about juvenile curfew and restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, I did talk to G1 this afternoon because we saw your question yesterday. The order is in fact canceled. Uh, <clears throat> so that is something that perhaps we had to relook. But there is no specific order that, that talks about uh, juvenile curfew for Marine Corps Base Camp at this moment since that order has been canceled. Now, uh, I will suggest, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, we do have several, or we have three specific non-emergency lines at PMO. If for some reason you have situations where uh, you feel like you need additional assistance, please call that non-emergency line. If it's not an emergency, and we'll, we will come and support you. Uh, yes, sir, I understand that. It's not really for me. It's more for the junior enlisted and, and wives home alone with small children. Um, I'd go out and yell at somebody at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'll have a problem. But we do have a lot of younger wives and uh, wives and spouses without their uh, significant other at home at times. And um, in the neighborhoods, these it's kind of it's become an issue. These people are getting scared in the middle of the night and kids getting woken up um, from kids being, well, kids but running amok a little bit. So... Um, I appreciate that. So, so ma'am, if, if, if I may, um, yes. you know, I'm, I'm not only the MCIE SAR major, but I'm also a client, right? Yes. And, and I'm with you. Um, but, you know, part of the reason why we do orders and regulations and policies is because there's a need. Now, if we're seeing that there's a change in the tide and, and there becomes a need, right, then, yeah, we need to address that. But the other thing that we need to be able to do is, one, don't wait till you're so fed up that you're losing your mind to call somebody for help. If it's a PMO issue, just make it a PMO issue. And I know a lot of us, and, and I'll speak from experience uh, just now, 
Um, we had some issues going on in our housing area. We got PMO involved. They asked some questions. And whether or not anything comes out of it, at least we gave it the attention it deserved because this is our house. This is our home. And we live on base because we feel safe. And we feel safe enough to have our children run around like little banshees until 2200 at night. And we do that because we love our place. So I would echo uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pinellas, if there are specific things, same with the dogs. If, if, if part of the reason why we have some of the issues that we, that we do have is that we don't say anything, that we don't make it a priority to make our homes safe, okay? When I used to deploy, I used to be okay because my wife was on base. She was on base with my children, and I was good with that, just like you were, just like a lot of our peers were, and what we do day in and day out, we do because we feel safe because of the gates that are, com that are, that are here protecting uh, the families and our children. And I would ask that just, one, band together as a community, two, if there's people speeding up and down your, uh, up and down your roads, right, uh, say something, report it, do something about it, don't do anything crazy, but do something about it and make it your community. Um, but yes, ma'am, if, if, if there's a need for a change, we also have quiet hours. People forget about those, though, too, right? So. I, I have one other question for my husband who had to go back to work, if that's okay. His question is relative to housing safety as well. I guess we had an issue with somebody with a gun that was being looked for by PMO in our neighborhood a while back, and he wanted to know why there wasn't a mass notification to lock doors and get inside. He said that's a serious safety issue. There were people outside walking dogs and all sorts of stuff. And he wanted to know why the mass notification system was not used this last um, season when that occurred. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you very much for your question. And, and that is a very important question. Uh, we do have uh, mass notification systems and we have other means to, to alert the community. This is something that uh, as we go through this process, we will make sure that we, we make it a part of our uh, procedures to ensure that the communication is, is, is provided in a timely manner for those that need to have that information. Yeah, Ma'am, if I could real quick also, because the Star Major and I are, are partners in this with PMO as well. So I'm John Giltz, the AMCC Project Director. And first, I just want to tell you that, that your uh, resident advisory board member brought that up emphatically on Monday. So plug, plug for the resident advise board, uh, advisory board members that are out there. We talked about it at length. And a couple things came up, and I can't remember if it was exactly your community or not, but one was kids, and we definitely, the, the PMO officer that was there, we talked about patterns of life and still please call, they will come. And you know what, what I found, and my oldest son was one of them, kids are kind of dumb. You think they run away, so why call? They just go down the street and they get caught, and you know what? They tell on everybody. So please call in. And the second thing was uh, a recent trend, apparently, where we've got some folks coming out uh, through our neighborhoods uh, the night before trash night, picking up a lot of stuff. Makes people uncomfortable. You mentioned you know, deployed spouse and others. That would freak me out if I was deployed and I got that call from my wife about somebody out back digging through our stuff. So we gave the trash schedule to PMO two or three days ago and asked them to be vigilant in the, in the day before in the various neighborhoods to come through and ask those folks to move on. You know, it's a private community. Hey, look, I know you're trying to make a living, but this isn't what you're supposed to be doing and move along. So good example of it coming up in the community to Sergeant Major's point, bringing it to a RAB member, and uh, we want to push that along to resolution. So sorry to interrupt the lady standing there, but I wanted to say that as well. Hi, I, I kind of want to add on to her issue with the 5500-6B uh, being canceled. The other part to that is that that was also the rule for kids walking to school by themselves was included in that. Kids being home by themselves was included in that order. Um, so currently there is no order on the space for the age of kids being left home alone, how long they can be left at home for their ages. So as of right now, we have universal pre-K starting next year potentially, and that means we potentially have 100 pre-K kids who can walk to school by themselves from walk-ins in Berkeley um, over a mile to JPS on Stone Street. Um, prior, 
the 5500-6B stated that it was the age of 10 is when they could walk to school by themselves. Um, so I'm just wondering if there is any reason now to have an order placed. <laughs> I will take that on personally. Um, we will make sure that uh, we have an order that is uh, also, you know, with input from our family members um, and all our tenants and uh, and also the individuals that are here on the panel. Uh, make sure to get that input and to uh, to update that order. But uh, specifically, uh, I'll let Ms. Fulton talk about. I just wanted to say, absent an order, the, the Family Advocacy Program currently uses the North Carolina Fire Code, which restricts um, children being alone to eight years old and older. So um, if, if you see a child that you know, is not being supervised or you have a concern about that, you can contact the Family Advocacy Program or PMO and um, let them know about that. And then I have one more question that you might actually be able to answer. Um, so as an EFMP family and a child who is special needs and has an IEP, um, it has come to my attention that when the need for advocacy for IEP meetings comes, um, the EFMP lawyer who is who we refer to is not able to help us if our child is in the DODEA school systems. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering who that leaves our EFMP families to go to and be able to get that free legal help for um, advocating for that. So I can share this one with Sarah if she has anything to add to it. Um, the EFMP attorney is available for all EFMP families. Her name is Vicki O'Brien and she is happy to talk to any family um, that has a concern with an IEP or any other EFMP issue. The only difference is that she is not able to litigate cases against a DODEA school like she could um, where she is uh, registered like in the state of North Carolina. She could do that through for a public school. But she's still absolutely willing to sit down and talk about what your legal rights are and those types of things. Um, then our, our families that have a child with an IEP, those families are um, fall under the mandatory um, uh, program for EFMP under an educational disability. And so um, they would rate a case manager through the EFMP program, and that case manager, if requested, is able to go to an IEP meeting or, or meet with the family ahead of time and talk through the issues, let them know what their legal rights are, and um, offer them suggestions on, you know, how to transverse that meeting, you know, suggestions for um, getting the support that they need through the schools. Thank you. Okay, we've had a number of uh, questions uh, regarding uh, pharmacy weights. Um, so, Captain Brown, I'll let you take the mic and talk about um, how that's going. Yeah, so uh, thanks. I, you know, I think I'll kick it off by um, kind of giving a, an update of some recent changes that have impacted us, impacted you all, versus for pharmacy, uh, and actually impacting um, uh, a good deal of the nation, which includes some of our network providers if you try to get pharmaceuticals out in town. Uh, so if you're not tracking, uh, about a week ago, last week, uh, there's a third party vendor uh, that is a large vendor that, that processes uh, transactions in, in the pharmacy world. Uh, and it's called uh, Change Healthcare is the name of the, the vendor. Um, it's quite large. Uh, it actually processes about a third of all pharmaceutical transactions in the entire country. Uh, and it so happens that uh, all DOD uh, pharmacy uh, transactions are, are uh, processed through this vendor. Uh, and last week, this vendor uh, suffered a, a cyber attack. Uh, and, and what the company did was they, when they, they detected the cyber attack, and what they did is they took their, that network and that service completely offline uh, because the concern was uh, that there uh, may be a risk uh, to getting after um, information held in that, that repository. The good news is it appears there's not been a breach of any private information. The bad news is they've not fixed that yet and that service is still offline. Um, uh, what does that mean and why does it matter to you and to us? Uh, uh, all transactions, rather than being automated now for every single pharmacy transaction, has to be done manually. It's the only bypass. 
uh, and, and to put some numbers on it, an automated transaction for a refill, a single refill, uh, in using this, this third-party uh, vendor takes about five minutes. Uh, to do that same transaction manually safely uh, takes about an hour. Uh, so you, you know, you look at the volume of, of transactions that we have, and, and the lag time associated with that, you know, is, is quite significant. Uh, we 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 don't have a whole lot of decision space, uh, really. Uh, what we can do is process everything manually, which is what we're doing. And, and again, it's a heavy lift, and it and it's generating some additional wait times, some significant wait times. I'll I'll go over that in a second. Uh, our only other thing that we could do, and and some. Um, MTFs have done this based on resourcing, is to stop processing refills altogether and to just manage emergency pharmacy uh, fills. And, 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 you know, we are, we're stretched pretty thin, but we're not in a place that, that we think that, that we should do that. Because you know, we don't have a good option for you otherwise, right? Because, as I said, this is a national hit, uh, and a lot of our uh, contracted, uh, TRICARE-supported pharmaceutical fills in the network are also impacted by this, number one. And number two, uh, even if uh, you could get uh, prescriptions filled out in town through a, a retail vendor, um, the, the billing transaction is also tied up with this third party vendor, such that it's possible that you may get stuck with a bill after the fact when, when all this clears up. So because there's no good option uh, really to, to us closing down refill prescriptions, what we've elected to do is just continue to push hard and process everything manually, knowing that that, that contributes to, to uh, you know, some additional wait times. Uh, right now, um, what we're looking at is about a, a six-day lag for refills. So good news is uh, for things that are emergent you need today for, for you know, those must-fill nows, uh, there's, there's a wait, uh, but, but that will be processed the same day for your refills is really where the impact is. Uh, so what we've done anticipating that uh, is, is we looked at our business rules and how early you can activate a refill uh, to turn it on. Uh, and we've loosened those up considerably such that uh, what we would ask is about six to seven days when you, before you would anticipate needing a, a refill and a prescription, go in and activate that. And what that will do is account for our anticipated lag times until that vendor comes back online. So again, six days, seven days to be perfectly safe, probably seven days. Uh, activate the refill and we will continue uh, to fill those at this time. So, so in the last week, uh, if you've anticipated some increased wait times, that's the why behind the what uh, and, and what we're doing ab about that. Uh, what I would also ask that you do is, is uh, Riley and, and the PAO team are doing a really nice job, I feel, bi biased of course, but I feel they're doing a really good job of pushing information and updates. So if you track our website uh, and, uh, and also keep track of us on our social media sites, uh, Riley is keeping an update real time so you'll know when those services come back online and, and when you can anticipate us going back, down, back to uh, our baseline. Uh, and, uh, and if you don't, uh, you don't feel like looking for those, Googling for those things, uh, Riley brought some cards in the back that you can pick up that has uh, our website and then also links to social media and, and uh, the app that we have uh, that also has uh, good updates for pharmacy. So hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Lady in the back. Um, my questions were answered earlier. I just wanted to clarify. Um, I was the one who advocated for the fenced park. So I just wanted to um, actually just say thank you um, for how fast the turnover was for getting that done. Um, it was incredible and it speaks volumes and like you said it really means a lot i have a son with special needs um, who elopes i don't know if you many of you know what that means but he has no sense of danger he can run in the road he will run in the water um, so just having one safe space to take him to um, means a lot and um, so further, the other question I had, I really wasn't directing the inclusive park to AMCC. It was really for the base and MCCS to take that on um, respectfully. I was kind of wanting um, an updated inclusive park to be handled by base or by 
the NCCS. So I guess my question is for them. And then I had another question about the, the beach mat, because that was my question as well. Um, they do make ones that roll up, so the tide really wouldn't be an issue. Um, is that something there's like a timeline on? And then is that something maybe the lifeguards could do? Just to like further clarify. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for the clarification. So as it pertains to uh, the adaptive playgrounds, so we do have some, as you're aware, at, at that same park, at the Paradise Point, um, uh, that probably is, uh, we're open to your suggestions as we would look at adding or changing, and it would just have to be something that we would put into a budget request. But please make sure that you get that information to us. Make some recommendations and suggestions about some additional adaptive equipment, and we'll take it from there. And then as it pertains to that, I've looked at a number of models of these roll-up mats at the beach, um, and, and we'll just continue to pursue it and try and figure out the art of the possible. Right now, the, the issue is, the tides and, and, and you know, g getting, getting them in and out. It, it's nothing that I could put on lifeguards because, you know, they're, they're taxed with their primary responsibilities. But we're going to continue to try and, you know, figure out a way to, you know, make it better out there. But thank you. I appreciate that. Um, also, with the inclusive park, there's um, AMCC touched on a little bit, but inclusive means actually that it's fenced and so the one at the bicentennial community center isn't fenced um, and it also means that the level um, is even so there's mulch there and there's turf i know it's like a simple it seems like something simple but it it um, makes a huge difference so they're really technically i guess now that we have the fence park at paradise point um, it just needs some improvement because it's outdated um, and there's like some features um, that are missing that would make it inclusive. Just like at um, Hospital Point, we have a playground there. Even though it's not fenced, there is a nice playground, but the one to the right of the other one is has been caution taped and broken for a few years, um, almost three years since we've been here. So I was kind of wondering also on that one if there's a plan to fix that or remove it because it would be a beautiful space for them to like put in a park there in the future. <laughs> and then that's it. Thank you for that. And I meant what I said earlier. And. Um, so I'd like to get your name as well and, and talk to you a little bit more because this is an area uh, that uh, I do feel passionately about and we have done things. Uh, but I'd like to talk to you about some of these other ideas. Um, if we only have one throughout our communities that's, that I call all inclusive and, and you know better than me what it, what it really means to you and your family and lots of other families, uh, then my commitment to you is I'll do what I can. Uh, I raised my family here. Uh, all our kids grew up here, and this is a wonderful place. But if it's something less wonderful for many of our families, including you, then I'll do what I can to make it something better than it is. To the hospital point question and the fence playgrounds. So I mentioned earlier we, had 100, we have 117 playgrounds across all of AMCC. The problem is uh, somebody got the wild idea that, to build most of them back in the early 90s. And so when we did a 100% inspection based on new standards, uh, a year or two before I took the job, many of them failed. Uh, and so I cannot, will not put your families in harm's way, head entrapment and other things. So the ones that are fenced now, there could be damage. We, we fixed all of those that were fixable and could still be safe, but the rest are gonna be demolished. And there's 15 left that need to be demolished. Most are in TT1. Uh, as a matter of fact, just for the audience, at one time there were 18 playgrounds in TT1. That's a 900 unit E1 to E5 family area. All 18 were closed for safety reasons. We've opened a couple back up, but uh, I would like to talk to you separately and, and hear directly from you on your thoughts. I actually um, was just meaning like fence to keep them enclosed. <laughs> like I, I know you yeah. you, you yeah, have no, some. No. Okay. No, I knew what you meant, but there's oh, two okay. different types of fence. The one in Hospital Point that referred to uh, is is most likely going to be demolished because it's demolished. not safe okay. and we can't fix it but the fencing at Bicentennial or somewhere else. Uh, I'm serious, I would like to hear from you, and maybe okay. it's not at the Bicentennial Great. one, but somewhere else. Uh, we'd like it to be somewhere where many families can enjoy it, but I'll be all ears right. and we'll see what we can do, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Okay. John, you keep that mic, because I got a question for you. 
Um, this is a BAH question. Uh, based on previous ra raises and fluctuations, why does the PPV pocket every cent and why not just fix a number? Uh, when people get raises, why does the BAH uh, get pocketed? So why isn't it consistent? Some Marines are struggling like single income households with multiple children who would have to pay for child care. Is there anything that can be done about that? Yeah, so thank you. And General Trollinger, I won't walk over there and freak you out anymore. I was, I was actually coming over there because of the camera and I wanted to talk to folks online. And I don't, I don't like to sit. Um, so multiple parts to that question. And first off, I will say anytime your, your BAH goes up and your rent goes up, uh, look, I get it. Uh, a year ago, I went on a road show in multiple communities when we did go full bond in a lot of areas. And I heard the stories and I understand and I empathize. There are folks that were paying for college with the amount they were getting back in concessions. Uh, there were folks building homes in different places, and there were folks trying to put food on the table. So I do get it. It's a very personal matter what you pay for your home. The second point I would make is that BAH is driven off the market out in town. And it's intended to cover your rent at 95% of what your rent would be, and the rest is supposed to be somewhat out of pocket. I don't make the rules, that's just what they are. When these PPVs were put together, there never was a thought that there would be a thing called a concession. And I got asked as recently as this, as, as this morning as to why we have concessions. It's supposed to be BA equals rent. And the rent and the bar are supposed to kind of match what you would find out in town uh, if it was competitive. So I am under severe pressure to generate as much as I can to roll back into the project. So we raise rent when the market indicates. And yes, we did that quite a bit uh, a, about a year ago when the rates went up. But what I'd like to tell you is uh, maybe hidden somewhere in that question, and if I'm wrong, I apologize, is, is not just the real thing for you, which is uh, the difficulties of paying the bills, but I want to give you my commitment and back it up with some facts on what we've done. I can only speak to the nearly five years I've been here. And Florence was devastating, but we have rolled in and we are spending at a rate, and if you want, you can come talk to me afterwards, you can come by my office, my, number, my phone number and cell number all, all over the place, and I'll share details with you but we are spending 200% more across the board at the macro level on you and your homes than we were in 2018. Now some of that's inflation, just basic inflation. Some of that is utilities. When the, when the utility savings program went away, folks started using a lot more uh, utilities. Our property insurance is about to go up another 25%. In 2018, it was three and a half million. It's about to be 8.8 .8 million per year. I don't pay that. You pay that. You trust me with your BAH to put it back into your homes and pay the bills. And that's what we do. And we spend what you bring in. And I am accountable personally and directly to the CG. I have spoken to the Commandant about this. Multiple general officers at Camp Lejeune, families, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups. And I'm willing to talk to any individual or any group, a spouse's group, a neighborhood, whatever it is, and explain to you why your rent went up, what it was based on as best I know, and what I am doing with what you've trusted me with, and I'll end where I started. I know it's very personal. I know in some cases it was a dramatic increase, and I do understand and I do empathize. I just ask you to trust that when that comes in, I am plowing it back into your community, literally plowing it back into your community. Thank you. Thanks, John. Gentlemen, sir. Good evening, all. My name is Michael Feeks. I'm a second lieutenant at Headquarters Battalion, 2nd Marine Division. Um, my question pertains to walking distances uh, getting to work. Um, obviously, I'm at Headquarters Battalion where you have Marines working at uh, different working stations, you know, at several different uh, locations across a wide area. Um, but for most of my Marines in H1, they're having to walk a mile, uh, half a mile to a quarter mile per day just to get to work and back. Um, Obviously, the Marines can eat that for breakfast, but, you know, God forbid it rains, they get put on restriction, and if I'm a 20-year-old Marine and I'm about to get out, you know, that's just one more reason why I may want to uh, get out of the Marine Corps. Um, you know, obviously, I don't know what the way forward is to address this, but I'm just curious if this is something that's been talked about in the past, um, something that's been acknowledged uh, by you all. 
I just want to clarify the question. It's uh, from the distance that your Marines have to walk from their barracks to H1? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, I, I don't think we have taken a look at that. I know that um, there are plans uh, to move the division headquarters uh, from H1 um, into where CLR 27 headquarters is currently at. Um, I don't know if that's going to decrease or increase the, uh, the traffic um, from the barracks uh, to their headquarters, but we, we do have plans uh, for a, a MEF headquarters, division headquarters, and also an MLG headquarters, and those are fully funded, and, uh, and we're just waiting on uh, some sequencing, and you can see that the MEF headquarters is already done. Um, Bob, do you have any, anything to add to that? Yes, sir. I would just add that, that broadly speaking, um, you know, we do master planning for the base, and a component of that always is, is the walkability. But you can imagine how challenging it is to ensure that everyone, you know, is, that every building is walkable. But that's a component of the planning that goes into where facilities are sited and where barracks are. Uh, it's just a, a challenging process. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. How are you? you? Guys hanging out all right up there? I'm good. All right. Um, I'm an active member, as uh, John Giltz would put it. I've exchanged some emails with him. I see he brought the AMCC entourage out here. I have some questions for the, uh, the panel here, along with himself. Uh, my actual name is Thomas Mooney. I'm a staff sergeant. The question I have to uh, present, there's probably a lot in there, but one of them is, as far as the housing construction and maintenance goes, who's the oversight for that? On building codes, um, that might be an MHO question. Uh, we've dealt with them quite extensively. And the follow-up question for, for that afterwards would be, what is the MHO and what do they do? Who are they, what are they actually advocating? Well, to answer your question for the MHO, so, um, the, the MHO has four different branches, and, but as far as for the advocacy, what we do is for residents that reside on base, we have a three-step process. Once you've gone to your, uh, PP, we have two PPE partners at Camp Lejeune, uh, and AMCC and Liberty Military Housing. So once you've gone to your community manager for your respective neighborhood and you're not satisfied with the issue, then you go to the step two process, which is the PPV management for assistance. Then again, if you're still not satisfied, you contact the MHO. We have an advocacy team there. Um, there's a 13 employee plus up that we did in um, accordance with National Authorization Act. And they're there to work in conjunction with the resident, AMCC. We take their team, their environmental team, their maintenance team, whatever the issue may be, neighbor complaints, pet complaints, whatever it is. And um, when it's maintenance, we do combined inspections and we advocate for both the resident and the partner. And we're there to help mediate any situation and to assure that um, the complete maintenance is getting resolved and the issue is getting resolved to the satisfaction of both parties. That's what we do as an advocate. We um, take the, um, each situation under advisement. We do inspections. And like I said, the, the main thing that we do is we work in conjunction with the partners and try to come up to the best resolution for, for the, uh, the resident. On the uh, inspections pieces, who performs those inspections? Is it inspectors, certified inspectors? The inspectors, um, we do have inspectors at the base. Some of them are um, going through certification processes now. It's been a, a funding issue getting them certified, but we're actually hosting two certification classes coming up in April and May to get them certified. But the um, inspectors 
have training, they have on-the-job training, and I can't speak for the partners with their certifications, but I know that they do have a um, wonderful environmental specialist there, safety team and maintenance team. And we try to all do the combined, depending on what the issue is in the home, we try to get the correct people out there to do that inspection. And we do it combined so that we're all seeing the same thing at the same time to try to get to a resolution. When you refer to the partners, uh, who would that be? AMCC or Liberty, whichever housing partner that you reside with. Okay, so the company that is performing the work has the same company performing the inspection? Yes, unless they've subcontracted it out, yes. Very well. And the other question I have for uh, the housing is, what, what is the current wait list on the housing? There are 11 different housing areas, so it depends on which housing area you're speaking about. Some, you know, there, I, I actually have the list with me if speci for specific housing areas. I'd be glad to give you a copy if you'd like, like okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, turning our attention back to the TOP gate, we've had some questions that have come online. Uh, there's been some concern about emergency vehicles. If that gate is closed, how will you accommodate uh, emergency vehicles coming on and off uh, via the T TOP gate. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, part of our, the work that we're doing prior to implementation is to uh, collaborate with our uh, on-base counterparts and also off-base counterparts. And, and through that work, we are going to assess and, and ensure that we have a plan to uh, facilitate emergency vehicle access when necessary. <clears throat> uh, I can tell you that in working with the uh, fire department, uh, the EMS on base, they already have a plan for that, and we're going to incorporate that into our processes and procedures. Uh, by the time we get to the implementation, all of that will be in place. Our fire and emergency services department uh, participated in the planning team and they were they were they were fully involved, and we received their input, and and that is that is one of the goals is to allow them to be able because we have mutual mutual aid agreements with uh, our partners in the county and also in the city, and uh, and so um, when there is a a mutual aid agreement or or they're going to provide mutual aid, uh, we will open the gate for them uh, throughout, and we'll continue to assess that. Okay, we're nearing the uh, 7.30. I want to make sure that anyone else here in the theater gets their question in. Does anyone else have questions? Because um, we have plenty of them online. Um, one question again, another. Yes. Oh, I apologize. Go Sorry, ahead. I snuck up here. Yep. Good evening, Barbie Abernathy. I had a couple things, one for the hospital. Uh, even before the cyber attack, uh, wait time, three to four hours, was about average, uh, whether it's a refill or a new prescription. Is there any way, and I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, for uh, more staff um, or better procedures as far as that? And also, anything to flag the system when somebody's trying to get some meds, because my husband was sitting there for over six hours one day, and then he found out that, like, the meds weren't carried. So is there any resolution with that? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so thanks. You know, so the first question, um, you know, staffing, uh, full disclosure, uh, in the last three years, we're down about 20% staffing in the pharmacy. Uh, some of that, um, I, there are lots of reasons, I, I think, to that. Uh, some of that, I think, is recoverable, and we're working on. Uh, relative to last year, we've seen an increase in our staffing. It's, it's modest, but, a, but a, an increase. We're looking at the staffing uh, in the farm, actually in multiple areas, to include the pharmacy. Our performance, you know, as you probably know, we have active duty staff. Uh, we have civilian personnel and we have some contracts. Not surprising, the performance of each of those uh, is not the same. Uh, so we've been working hard on changing the construct 
for those things that perform more, perhaps investing more in those things and, and divesting from some of those vehicles that have not performed as well. And that work is ongoing. We're somewhat constrained because we have uh, statutory caps on all of those things. Uh, and, and you know it's really challenged to influence that. Uh, one of the more promising things that we've been looking at uh, is uh, for our active duty fills, um, we are, uh, like any other CONUS location, we are the lowest priority for active duty fills. So, you know, first priority go to operational platforms, and by the way, in the last five years, there have been a lot more of those um, uh, platforms. Uh, second priority goes to overseas locations, and then third priority is CONUS locations. We made a pretty compelling argument, I think, up echelon that um, all CONUS locations are not the same, and there are uh, marketplaces as we reside in and work in uh, that are at a disadvantage relative to other places where there are more resources that can be leveraged on the outside, either in the network and or uh, marketplaces that have more assets to hire, either via contract or, or civilian personnel. Uh, and we, we have a, a draft up. Uh, that would maybe look at, allow us to look at the, the prioritization of our active duty fills such that CONUS locations aren't looked the same and, and we, would, we would be favorably um, impressed by that. We, we would essentially potentially receive more active duty personnel. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that that is, um, I don't want to use the term likely, but I think that that has promise in, as it goes forward, which will help relieve some of the strain there. Another thing that we're restricted for it by in policy is uh, for hires on the civilian personnel side, there's a, there is law in place that they're required to have one or two, depending upon what we're hiring, one or two years of, of experience before we can hire them on board. Uh, and that we've taken that up echelon. Actually, the director for DHA is advocating for us to, to do away with that because we do a lot of training. We have a lot of training affiliation agreements uh, with uh, local services, community college, et cetera, a lot of universities, wherein we have people who come and do a year or so of training with us to complete their training, who already live in the area, uh, who are interested in staying in the area. We know a lot about them because they've been working with us for a year or so, and we would love to hire them, and we can't right now. And what happens is they go elsewhere to get a job, to get a year of experience, and many times don't come back. So we're working a lot of angles there to try to increase the labor force that's available to provide pharmaceutical services. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a lot of promise that, that those are gonna pay off for us. Uh, the other thing, if you're not tracking, and, and we try to pitch this wherever we go, uh, Q Anywhere. If you're not tracking Q Anywhere, I would encourage you, and we can, we can stand by tonight and, and give you some, some feedback on how to do that. Um, Unfortunately, Q Anywhere is impacted by the cyber attack right now, so that service is down. Uh, but that will come back online, and for those patients who are used, using Q Anywhere, essentially what it is is you can wait for your pharmaceutical to be filled someplace else rather than sitting in our pharmacy. And then when it's filled, you're notified, and you can come in, and, and it's pretty sh short turn and wait actually physically in the building to get your prescription. So if you're not tracking that service, we brought that online about a year and a half ago or so. Uh, and it's actually been really well received by both our staff and, and, and our patients. Did I hit both your questions? I talked a lot. I'm not sure if I got them both. Yeah, I think so. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, the next big thing that I'm concerned about, obviously the TOP gate. Um, obviously from the online stuff, you know, it affects many people. Uh, beaches, beach season is coming up. Uh, weekends, you know, people do the commissary. I know myself, I go for runs with groups and stuff on the weekends here on base. Um, I just want you all to consider all that stuff. My husband works Stone Bay. I work New River and Cherry Point. So Hubert is definitely our midway for everything. Um, so I need you guys to please consider all that stuff along with everybody else that said everything online um, and here tonight. Um, one good suggestion is having it closed at night, even though I don't want to see it closed at night. But um, yeah, there's something to consider. And I definitely agree about the upgrade. So I just wanted to throw that in there. 
Thank you. Nat, how are we doing on time? We are, we are at uh, 1930 right now, but I want to give this lady a chance. Okay. I just want to follow up with a question I asked earlier. Um, just two parts. First, what if a caseworker, EFMP caseworker, is not knowledgeable in the IEP advocate and they don't feel comfortable doing that, then where do we go? Because that is occurring. And secondly, um, you stated that EFMP lawyer is not able to litigate. Um, so that has left our base families who are dealing with DODEA unable having to pay for the litigations that they have. Um, do you have any answers or solutions for that or who they can go to about that kind of stuff? Um, I, I don't have an answer for you as far as the litigation piece. That's a federal law that you can't litigate against the federal government right. in certain circumstances. Um, I would suggest if you have any issues with an EFMP case manager um, that you contact the program manager, which is Stacy Huntington, and we can get you her contact information. And um, for you or any parent who has an issue with a caseworker, you know, some of them are newer. They may not have had, you know, as extensive training in the IEP process and the uh, FAPE and, and um, IDEA rules. So, you know, they may need some support. And Stacy would be able to um, communicate with you about that. Thank you. Okay, that pretty much uh, wraps it up. Um, I really thought this was going to be painful pulling questions out, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, or I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm wrong. We have a lot of uh, questions that were, went unanswered online, uh, but just note that those questions are also important. We are registering them. There have been plenty of comments about potholes, about speeding in certain sections, so we'll ensure that those are all registered with the appropriate personnel. Uh, we also have a resources table. If you weren't able to get your answers, please look at those resources. Do your research. But at the same time, we have Corporal Brown over here who's raising his hand. If you didn't get a question, we're going to get that question answered, okay? And again, thank you to those who are online who have been, who have been submitting questions as well. General, I'll let you have the last word. Last word is uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for everybody that's online. There's some tough choices that, uh, that we have to make, and then we have to make tough choices with limited resources. Uh, that's not to make excuses, but this feedback is, is uh, welcomed. This feedback is important to us so we can get better and we can make improvements. And uh, like Nat said, is if we hadn't answered your question just yet, uh, make sure you, you get that to the individual over here, the corporal over here. But then also online, we'll make sure we record those and get online, and then we'll provide feedback to you. There are other resources on ways to provide feedback, and uh, they're on the table over there. And I'd also like to thank the, uh, the Campbell Jordan leadership over here and their family members for attending and also listening to, uh, to what we're providing to you all. Thank you very much for coming again, and uh, have a safe trip home.